Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Wasn't that wonderful? Can I just say something too, and something I don't do a lot? I don't know why I'm so emotional today. We've got so many people in this church who are giving up their time, sacrificing their time, and using their talents, and using their treasure for God to serve Him in ministry. Planning a church is hard work. It's all hands on deck. If you didn't think so, welcome. It's a lot of work. Um, but I just want to say thank you. I mean, Brian and Melina, Lindsay, Kylea, Jeremy, Keith. I mean, everybody, everybody, everybody who is serving every weekend, who is doing things behind the scene. And I want to say thank you, too, to those who are, are, are unable to physically serve, but who I know are serving by wearing out their knees and praying. And I just want to say thank you. Um, this is such a cool family, so thank you. Turn in your Bibles, wait for it, to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah. We've been doing a series in the book of Daniel, and I want to jump back into where we left off last week. But I want to look at the book of Jonah real quick, and I want to contrast this, if you remember last week, with the response of Daniel to King Nebuchadnezzar. Hearing this dream Hearing the dream being poured out from King Nebuchadnezzar to Daniel, he was both stunned and alarmed. He was moved with compassion. He was broken for the king. And he spoke the truth in love, ultimately telling him, hey, you king need to separate yourself from your sin by doing what is right. You need to show mercy to those who it, who it is within your power to show mercy to. And perhaps, he said, perhaps God will grant you, will extend your prosperity and will relent from the judgment that he has poured out on you. Look at the book of Jonah, though. I want to contrast this if I can. Remember this, Jonah, in the first chapter there, get up, go to the great city, verse 2, of Nineveh and preach against it because their evil has come in or up before me. So Jonah got up. But instead of going to Nineveh, he, he fled. He goes to Tarshish. Uh, he flees from the Lord's presence. He, he boards a boat. We all know the story. There's a storm. He goes down below. He is sleeping. The guys that are part of the crew on that ship find him sleeping. Hey, who are you? Who, who, who are you? Where are you from? And, and what did you do? And he tells them, hey, I'm, I'm a prophet. Uh, I serve the, the Hebrew God, the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. That's, that's who I serve. Um, and I and I've fled from him. So they get enough out of him to hear he, a prophet of God, has fled. They don't know why. They don't know what from. All they know is he has fled. And they presume from that this great storm is caused because of you, Jonah, boarding our boat and fleeing from God. What are we going to do? He says, hey, the right response, the prescription to this, throw me overboard and God will relent. And he does. And then this great fish swallows up Jonah. He's in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Chapter two is all about Jonah praying to the Lord, this wonderful, prophetic, compassionate prayer saying, hey, God, you are my salvation and I will Listen to and follow what you have said. So God causes this great fish, this big fish, this whale, to spit Jonah up on dry land. Chapter 3 picks up with the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach the message that I tell you. So he went and he preaches to them God's judgment. Forty days, you got 40 days. You need to repent. You need to get right with God. You need to turn from your evil, wicked ways and, and get on track. Turn to him. Maybe, just maybe, he will relent and, 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 and push back or, or forego pouring out his judgment on you. And they do just that from king down, right? From king down. They, sh they, they put on uh, sackcloth. They sit in ashes. They repent. They fast. No food, no water the king puts out. Hey, we're going to repent, we're going to fast, we're going to get right with the Lord, and we are going to present ourselves, humbling ourselves under his authority, his rightful authority to judge us, 
and his ability to forgive, to atone, to relent, to turn back from that judgment. We're going to present ourselves to him. So they do just that. Verse 10 of chapter 3, God saw their actions that they had turned from their evil ways. So God relented from the disaster he had threatened them with, and he did not do it. Chapter 4, Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. Can you imagine that? You preach the gospel. You preach your heart out. God's judgment is coming in 40 days. You need to turn from your evil, wicked ways. Get right with the Lord. Get on your hands and knees and cry out to him. They do just that, and he is not pleased with it. Verse 2, he prayed to the Lord, please, Lord, isn't this what I said? Here's the reason. We don't know the reason why he fled, but here it is. Isn't this why... What I said while I was still in my own country, that's why I fled toward Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you, a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. That's who you are. And now, Lord, take my life, he says, from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. Look at verse 4. The Lord asked him, is it right for you to be angry? Is it right for you to be angry? What's behind all of this with Jonah, the prophet Jonah sent to the Ninevites to say, hey, get right with God. You need to turn from your evil, wicked ways. You got 40 days. Here's the time. Here's your opportunity for repentance right here. And they do just that. And he is angry. He's angry because he sees them. He sees their sin. He's elevated himself to this position. I'm a Hebrew. Among Hebrews, we follow the God of the Bible. We follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of a covenant with us, promises to us. And these Ninevites have defied him, disobeyed him. And I want to see them just burn. I want to see their, God's judgment being poured out on them. So he is so filled with anger. We know the story, he climbs up, he sits down, he watches what's going to happen. Watching, I'm, I'm assuming here, by his anger, he's wanting and waiting for the judgment of God. Maybe they'll just screw up enough that the judgment of God will actually come. A tree, God causes a tree to grow up, provides him shade. During the night, a worm comes, eats it, the tree dies. He gets angry about that tree. Look what he says, verse 9 of Jonah Chapter 4, then God asked Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? He says, yes, it is. I'm angry enough, he says, to die. Look what the Lord says, verse 10. You cared about the plant, which you did not labor over and did not grow. It appeared in a night and perished in a night. Verse 11, so may I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who can't distinguish from their right and their left as well as many animals. That sounds like our country. They can't distinguish from their right and their left. There's no logic. There's no understanding. There's nothing. But God says that place, 120,000 people, I care for them. And what he is telling Jonah is your anger that is fueling your hatred for these people is not right. The anger that you had about the plant that you didn't plant, that you didn't cause to grow, is right. Because you're showing that you care about the plant. But you're showing that you care. You have anger about the, what happened to the plant. You have anger about the destruction of the plant. And you're showing that from your heart you actually care about this. And you don't care about the people. And God is saying, Jonah, I care about the people. We saw this last week with Daniel. And he, he looks at King Nebuchadnezzar. And he is both stunned and alarmed. And he looks at him with compassion. Enough compassion to say, my king, I love you. I love you enough that I'm going to speak the truth to you. You must, you must separate yourself from your sin. Do what's right. Or else God's judgment is going to come upon you. Go back to the book of Daniel. I want to show you two things before we move into our sermon or message this morning. I want to show you two things about King Nebuchadnezzar that we didn't get to last week. But it's going to help build. It's going to help build on what we're going to talk about this morning. Daniel chapter 4. 
Look at verse 16. It says, let his, that's King Nebuchadnezzar's mind, be changed from that of a human and let him be given the mind of an animal for seven periods of time. A lot of, a lot of scholars, a lot of commentators will draw correlations between King Nebuchadnezzar Babylon and the Antichrist and that final governmental system that's in place during the tribulation time before God or Jesus returns and, and presses out God's wrath. Right? In Revelation, we read about that. So a lot of folks would, would compare King Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom to that final kingdom. And we can see that in this verse. Let his mind be changed from that of a human, and let him be given the mind of an animal for seven periods of time. If you think about that from Revelation 13, the Antichrist comes up out of the sea. He's a beast. And look, he is given power, his throne, and great authority from Satan. And when we start to kind of draw comparisons to him and the Antichrist, you could say, well, this human figure that comes that's the Antichrist is actually possessed by Satan, and he's given power and a throne and authority by him. It's almost like his mind is being changed to that of an animal, a beast-like creature. So we can draw those comparisons, but I want you to see something else. As I begin, and, and you could say, yeah, that, I could see the, the similarity, and a lot of folks will say that in their commentaries. But I want you to see something else. Let's look at verse 14. He, the angel, coming down from heaven, called out loudly, cut down the tree, chop off its branches, strip off its leaves, scatter its fruit, let the animals flee from under it, and the birds from its branches, but... Leave the stump with its roots in the ground and with a band of iron and bronze around it and the tender grass of the field. Let him be drenched with dew from the sky and share the plants of the earth with the animals. Let his mind be changed from that of a human and let him be given the mind of an animal for seven periods of time. I see such a correlation in this, if you think about it. And I'm not standing on this dogmatically. I see such a correlation, though, with the nation of Israel. You think about how many times the nation of Israel went into exile. 400 plus years in Egypt, he pulls them back. 40 years in a wilderness, puts them in the promised land. Disobedience, defiance, continuous rebellion, hard-heartedness, stiff-neckedness against God. 70 years in Babylon. He keeps putting them in time out saying, hey, you have disobeyed and you have disrespected me and I have poured out in scripture through prophets to you time and time again saying, hey, if you do this, if you disobey, I will remove you from the land. Essentially cut you down, chop off your branches, strip off your leaves and scatter your fruit. I will scatter you among the nations. But you think about that too. King Nebuchadnezzar was given a mind of an animal from that of a human. His mind changed. Look at Romans chapter 11. I want to make this correlation with you or for you this morning because I want you to see this and I want you to see the comparison. We'll start in the ver first verse. And again, I'm not being dogmatic on this. I'm not trying to draw up doctrine from this or say, hey, this is in fact what this is. I just want you to see the similarity because it plays a part in what we're going to talk about in the rest of Daniel chapter 4 this morning. Starting in verse 1 of Romans 11, I ask then, this is Paul, has God rejected his people? Talking about the Israelites. Absolutely not. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, he says, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left and they're trying to take my life. But what was God's answer to him? He says, I have left 7,000 for myself who have not bowed down to Baal. In the same way then, there is also at this present time a remnant chosen by grace. Now if by grace, then it's not by works or, 
Otherwise, grace ceases to be grace. What then? Israel did not find what it was looking for, but the elect, those Israelites who believed in Jesus, who believed in Messiah, did find it. The rest, he says, were hardened. As it is written, God gave them, look at this, a spirit of stupor. Eyes that cannot see and ears that cannot hear to this day. And David said, let their table become a snare and a trap, a pitfall and retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent continually. David prophesied about this very thing. This is going to happen. Verse 11, I asked then, Paul says, have they not stumbled so as to fall? Or have they stumbled so as to fall? Absolutely not, he says. On the contrary, by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. Now, if their transgression brings riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fullness bring? Now I am speaking to you Gentiles. In so far as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. Why? If I might somehow make my own people jealous and save some of them. For if their rejection brings reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Now, if the first fruits are holy, so is the whole branch. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Now, if some of the branches were broken off, and you... Gentiles, though a wild branch were grafted in among them and have come to share in the rich root of the cultivated olive tree, do not boast that you are better than those branches, but if you do boast, you do not sustain the root, but the root sustains you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. True enough, they were broken off because of unbelief, but you stand by faith, he says. Don't be arrogant, but beware. Because if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Therefore, consider God's kindness and severity. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness towards you if you remain in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not remain in unbelief, will be grafted in because God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from your native wild olive tree and against nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Look what he says in verse 25. I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you will not be conceited. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. We think about that. This is an amazing opportunity for repentance. We look at the gospel plan, the plan of God to pour out the gospel, the message of the person and the work of Jesus Christ, the atoning, sacrificial blood of the Lamb. Jesus went to a cross, to a grave, raised to new life so that we could have salvation in no other name given under heaven, right? First and foremost, presented to the Israelites, the Jewish people who rejected Messiah. Some of them believed, You are Messiah. You are Yeshua HaMashiach. You are the guy. You are Him. We believe in you for forgiveness of sins, for salvation. But some did not. And those, remember this when Jesus lamented, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How I would have loved to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks and taking care of you, but now your house is left to you desolate. And how long does this this hardening take place? Well, it says until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, but they, Jesus says in his lament over Jerusalem, not until you see me coming on the clouds and acknowledge that I am him who comes in the name of the Lord, when you acknowledge that I am Yahweh, when you acknowledge me, when you lift up your eyes and see me and say, you are the most high, you are him, you are redeemer, you are Messiah, that's when the rest of Romans 11 begins to take place. You will be saved by all this, by this or in this way, all Israel will be saved. But what we see in this is an opportunity for repentance. 
salvation given to Israelites and then opened up to the Gentiles, we being able to be grafted in. That's such a beautiful picture of this and such a, 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 a very definitive thing that we need to understand. That's why I begin to compare this this week as I look through this, as I begin to study through this, the tree being chopped down the branches cut off, the leaves stripped, the fruit scattered. I couldn't help but to think about Israel and God crying out to them even through this story, hey, don't lose sight of who you are. Don't lose sight of this. Remember when I told you, you obey me, you follow me, blessings, you don't, curses, don't forget this. There's an opportunity for repentance. There is a time when God says you must repent If we repent, relenting can come. Principally speaking, that was offered first to the Israelites, but then it was opened up to everybody. We'll see this. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Look at the confidence in verse one. When all these things happen to you, the blessings and the curses I have set before you and you come to your senses while you are in all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you and you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and all your soul by doing everything I am commanding you today, then he will restore your fortunes Have compassion on you and gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. God promised the Israelites, you follow me, you follow my commands, you obey me, and I will take care of you. But if you don't, I will remove you from the land. I will scatter you amongst all the nations. But when you cry out to me, when you repent, when you turn from your evil ways, when you knock off the stubbornness of your evil heart and you get on your hands and knees and cry out to me, I will restore you. I will, I will put you back into the land and be in relationship with you. And we can say, well, this is for the Israelites. But look where this extends and understanding the principle of this and the divine nature of God and how this extends not only to the Israelites, this offer is not only to the Israelites, but to all people. Jeremiah chapter 18. Starting in verse seven, he says, at one moment I might announce concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will uproot, tear down, and destroy it. However, if that nation about which I have made the announcement turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the disaster I had planned to do it. At another time, I might announce concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it. However, if it does what is evil in my sight by not listening to me, I will relent concerning the good I had said I would do to it. So now say to the men of Judah and to the residents of Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says, look, I'm about to bring harm to you and make plans against you. Turn now each from your evil way and correct your ways and your deeds. But they will say, it's hopeless. We will continue to follow our plans. And each of us will continue to act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart. We see this understanding when God began to raise up the Israelites and give them the law, his instructions. He says, hey, if you obey me, if you keep my commands, when I put you into this land that I have promised you, I will bless you. 
But if you disobey me, if you turn from me, if you begin to seek out everything evil, everything defiant against me, I will uproot you and scatter you and you will be disciplined. And we see that time and time again with the Israelites. Understanding Romans chapter 11. We see this time now where a partial hardening has come upon them, where God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that can't see, ears that can't hear. Yeah, there are some who listen and hear the word of God, the gospel message of Christ, and they believe in Jesus for forgiveness of sins, for salvation, and they too saved by God's grace through faith in Christ. But he says back in Deuteronomy 30, when all of this happens and you turn, I will regather you. I will reconnect with you. I will be in right relationship with you. But that doesn't just apply to the Israelites. This is also for everybody else. Any nation that I say, hey, you need to stop doing what you're doing. I will uproot, tear you down, divide, cut, chop, strip, scatter. If you... Repent, turn from your evil ways. I will relent from doing the harm that I said. But the message through the prophet Jeremiah there is, they said, hey, there's no hope. We're gonna continue to do what we've been doing. We're gonna continue in the customs and the traditions that we've taken on. We're gonna continue to operate in the way that we think is best to operate. And what God says is, you're gonna continue in the stubbornness of your evil ways. Missing an opportunity for repentance. We're gonna finish Daniel chapter four. And we're gonna look at the rest of this chapter And we're gonna see this opportunity of repentance for King Nebuchadnezzar and we're gonna see what's what's behind his rejection of God's mercy. We're gonna see the sin that is in his heart that is behind his rejection of God's mercy. But I don't want you to miss this. We have an opportunity for repentance We just learned this through Romans chapter 11. God has graciously opened up salvation even to the Gentiles so that we can be saved, so that we can be grafted in. By God's grace, through faith in Christ, we can have the gift of salvation. And we can have a relationship with Christ where there is no condemnation. And we can be filled with the Spirit of God, sealed by His Spirit. Joint heirs of the promises and the covenants of God, the new covenant in Christ Jesus, in his blood. We have an opportunity for repentance now. I will tell you based on Romans 11, there is an until. That means that opportunity for repentance the offer of salvation that is freely given and freely offered will be rescinded at some point. And I just want to speak to you beyond that this morning, looking around the room saying, hey, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm not talking to you about repent, give your life to Jesus, accept what he did on the cross, be saved. I'm gonna speak to you for a few moments like we are all brothers and sisters in Christ, a part of the same family. We also have an opportunity for repentance, but we oftentimes keep stuff in our hearts. We oftentimes keep stuff between us and God, and we oftentimes just hold on to things, continuing in the stubbornness of our evil ways because we have it figured out. Instead of saying, no, I'm wrong. I need to pour this out. So my question this morning, is there something in your heart that needs to be cleared up? Is there something in your heart that needs to be cleared up? And as I look around, as I begin to talk to to friends about this and we begin to just start to 
really just rejoice at what is happening around the world. No, not rejoicing in the judgment that's coming, but rejoicing that we are going to be reunited with our Savior very soon. The opportunity for repentance is growing shorter and shorter and shorter. The opportunity for us to make things right with God and with brothers and sisters in Christ is growing shorter and shorter and shorter. And I'm going to tell you this week what God spoke in my life constantly and the conviction that I had was, John, you're holding on to a lot of junk and you need to make some things right with some people. And isn't it funny Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount says this, if you're there at the altar offering your gift and you remember that one of your brothers or sisters has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar and go and be reconciled to your brother and sister. And we continue in the stubbornness of our hearts. I continue in the stubbornness, continuing in the way things that I have been going, saying, no, I'm justified I'm vindicated, I'm right, and I refuse to do what I'm commanded to do, and then God makes ways. God makes opportunities. God causes divine appointments to happen so that I'm face to face with people who I need to go to and say, I'm so sorry. And I've had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity this week to do that. And what I'm saying to you is, I'm tired of living with junk in my heart. I'm tired of living with anger and resentment and bitterness. And I'm tired of that. I'm tired of giving Satan power in that area in my life. I want that stuff out. So I said, okay, please forgive me for what I have done so that I can live in the freedom of Christ and understanding. I don't have anything in my heart that needs to be cleared up. Look at this from Proverbs. Chapter 28, verse 13. The one who conceals his sins will not prosper. Here's the promise. But whoever confesses and renounces them will find mercy. There's been times in my life when I have I have lived with hidden sin, continuing in the stubbornness of my evil ways, lived with them for years, and had to go to people and say, I've been living with this and I am so sorry, and confess this before God, understanding, yes, against you and you alone I have sinned, but needing to make things right with a brother or sister in Christ so that I can live in in, in the freedom of Christ so that I can say, there's nothing in my heart that needs to be cleared up. Is there something in your heart that needs to be cleared up? Let's work through the rest of this chapter. Let's pray real quick as we approach this. Father God, thank you for your word. God, we have contrasting examples here with Daniel being stunned and alarmed at this message that he received from King Nebuchadnezzar and wanting to honor you, wanting to be obedient to you, but also wanting to be loving to someone he's in relationship with. He pours out the truth in love, telling him and pleading with him, separate yourself from your sin. God, thank you for that example that we have in your prophet, your servant, Daniel. And we can read about that. And God, thank you for the example, the contrasting example that we have in the prophet Jonah to look at his anger. He wanted nothing more than judgment for for hellfire to rain down on the Ninevites. But God, you expressed to him your compassion, your care for a people who didn't know any better, who needed to be spoken to, to hear your message, your word. God, help us, to, help us to respond the right way with those that we are in relationship with, not desiring their destruction or their downfall, but desiring repentance. 
And Father, as we think about this and we begin to explore this and study this, would you help us to search our own hearts? Because it starts with us. And if we have something against you, if we have something that we're holding back, if we have something in our hearts that needs to be cleared up, if we have relationships that are cut off because of things that we have done, God, would you help us, give us the courage and the strength to make those things right so that we can live in the freedom of Jesus, your blood, that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Help us to walk in that. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for this word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're gonna fly. Daniel chapter four, verse 28. If you remember verse 27, let's back up to that. Daniel says, therefore, may my advice seem good to you, my king. Separate yourself from your sins by doing what is right and from your injustices, by showing mercy to the needy, perhaps, perhaps there will be an extension of your prosperity. And then we see that didn't happen. Verse 28, all this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar at the end of 12 months, his opportunity for repentance as he was walking on the roof of the royal palace in Bab Babylon, the king exclaimed, revealing his heart, is this not Babylon the great that I have built to be a royal residence by my vast power and for my majestic glory? Look at this. We're going to stop there just for a minute because I want you to see what's behind King Nebuchadnezzar's rejection of God's offer of mercy. We think about this. The prophet Daniel pours out to him. Here's your dream. Here's what it means. The tree is you. Chopped down, cut, stripped, scattered. That tree is you, king. It's not going to be good for you. Judgment's going to come. Seven periods of time have been decreed against you from the Most High. And that will take place until you acknowledge the Most High is ruler over human kingdoms. And Daniel tells him, hey, this is what you need. Get on your hands and knees and crowd to God. Repent. For 12 months, he rejects this, that message in the back of his head. God's saying this to us now. We know the time limit that was put on King Nebuchadnezzar, 12 months. I'm going to give you 12 months. He doesn't know that, but we're given that information. 12 months go by. And then he stands up and he cries out from the pride and arrogance of his heart, look at this great city, this great kingdom that I have built up exalting himself to the position of most high. I want to talk about that just for a couple of minutes. Pride and arrogance. Turn to Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11. I'll give you a few verses here in the book of Proverbs. And then I'm going to define pride and arrogance for you. And then we'll finish out the chapter. Proverbs chapter 11, verse number 12. Whoever shows contempt for his neighbor. No, that's not it. Verse number two. When arrogance comes, scratch that, verse number two. When arrogance comes, disgrace follows, but with humility comes wisdom. Go to chapter 16. Hopefully this one's right. Verse number five. Everyone with a proud heart is detestable to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. Turn to, or look at verse 18 while we're in this chapter. Pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. Look at chapter 18. Chapter 18, verse 12. Before his downfall, a person's heart is proud, but humility comes before honor. Chapter 29. Chapter 29, verse 23. A person's pride will humble him, but a humble spirit will gain honor. So let's look at the definition of pride and arrogance real quick as it's meant in the Hebrew so that we can understand what is behind this pride and arrogance of King Nebuchadnezzar. So we see this. 
Pride and arrogance proceeds downfall. We see this time and time and time again throughout history. We see this in governmental leaders. We see this in our own lives. When we are filled with pride and arrogance, watch out. Destruction, downfall, something is coming when we elevate ourselves to a position of equality with God coming out from under his authority, that's when we need to start to watch out. Look at this though, pride. The Hebrew word there, gavon, means exalted or majesty. And this can have a, 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 this can have a positive sense, really. It can describe God, so not always a negative sense. But look at this quote. I pulled this from a theological word book that I use. And it says this about the word pride, about the, the root of that Hebrew word there, gavon. It says, sin enters the picture when there is a shift of ultimate confidence from God as object and source to oneself as object and source. Arrogance, much like this, the Hebrew word there, gava, means to be high or lofty, to make high or to exalt as in, I'm putting myself in the position of God, replacing God with myself so that I am the one who is high, lifted up, and exalted. And the nuance, folks, between the person being exalted and ultimately God who is to be exalted, the nuance here between those goes back as far as the Garden of Eden where Satan's temptation was for Adam and Eve to come out from under the authority of God and elevate themselves to a position of equality with God. And that's the ultimate definition be behind pride and arrogance. King Nebuchadnezzar was given an opportunity for repentance, but he continued to exalt himself he continued to glorify himself. He continued to raise himself up, not recognizing, not acknowledging the most high God who is ruler over all human kingdoms, but saying, no, look what I did to build this great, majestic, wonderful place, Babylon, which caused blindness which caused him to remain in the stubbornness of his evil heart, which caused him to build this pride and arrogance, relying on himself, the security of what he has built, the prosperity of what he has built, instead of saying, no, it's God. Go back to Daniel chapter four. Let's finish out the chapter, and I wanna give you two responses to this before we close. Daniel chapter four, let's pick it up in verse 31. While the words were still in, king's, in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared that the kingdom has departed from you. You will be driven away from people to live with the wild animals and you will feed on grass like cattle for seven periods of time until you acknowledge that the Most High is ruler over human kingdoms and he gives them to anyone he wants. So just like 12 months, we see an opportunity for repentance, but God also gives him a judgment of seven periods of time. But he says you will be judged for seven periods of time until you acknowledge God says that I am most high. He says this is your time, and at the end of that time you will acknowledge. It speaks too of the sovereignty of God. He knows what's going to happen. He knows King Nebuchadnezzar will cry out, will exalt him, will praise him, will point to him as most high. Isn't that interesting? Just a tidbit. Verse 33, at that moment, the message against Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled at that moment. This speaks to, folks, understand this, this speaks to, to the truth of nobody knows the day or the hour, Right? Nobody knows the day or the hour. Nobody knows the, the day or the hour. And we look at that in eschatology and prophetically speaking and we say that is rapture of the church, tribulation, uh, return of Christ, judgment, a millennial kingdom, all of these things in eschatology that we can begin to say, right? But nobody knows the day or the hour either of our own lives, our own mortality. 
And we must think about that. We must understand that. When God gives us an opportunity for repentance, today it says is the day of salvation. Why? Because you don't know about tomorrow. And it's the same thing for junk Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's the same thing for junk that we have in our hearts. We don't know. And I'll tell you this. On the other end of what is the issue, It could be something that is preventing that individual from moving forward and acknowledging who Christ is. And I can't control them. I can't control their hearts. But I don't want to be an obstacle. I don't want to be in the way of anybody following Jesus Christ purely without any obstruction. Think about that. When the time comes, the time comes. At that moment... The message against Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. Boom. He was driven away from people. He ate grass like cattle. And his body was drenched with dew from the sky until his hair grew like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. But at the end of those days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, speaking now in the first person, looked up to heaven and my sanity returned to me. Then I praised the Most High, and honored and glorified him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing, and he does what he wants with the army of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth. There's no one who can block his hand or say to him, what have you done? At that time, my sanity returned to me and my majesty and splendor returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and my nobles sought me out. I was reestablished over my kingdom and, and even more greatness came to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and glorify the king of the heavens because all his works are true and his ways are just. Look at this. He is able to humble those who walk in pride. Amen? There's two responses to this, to the offer of mercy by, for the offer of God or, or from God of his mercy. There's two responses that we can see. Response number one, one can choose to live in the stubbornness of their evil heart apart from God. That is a choice. The second choice, one can choose to live with a broken and humbled heart before God. Let's look at the first choice. One can choose to live in the stubbornness of their evil heart apart from God. Turn to 2 Peter. Second Peter chapter 3. This is in regards to this topic. An opportunity of repentance. And we look at this from different perspectives. Look outside of the doors of the church. Look outside of the family of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ. We look at the judgment that is coming. And we know it prophetically from God's word. We look at this in our own house. In our own families. In our own lives. In our own hearts knowing that what God has spoken is true. A time will come for judgment. Look what he says though. Verse three, above all, beware or be aware of this. Scoffers will come in the last days, scoffing and following their own evil desires, saying, look at this, where is his coming that he promised? Ever since our ancestors fell asleep, all things continue as they have been since the beginning of creation. Isn't that like right now in America? There's no difference. All of these things you guys keep talking about, we need to be saved from our sin and from the consequences of our sin. And it's been paid for by the blood of Jesus. You guys keep talking about this. And if you don't accept Messiah, if you don't believe in the name of Jesus for salvation, you will be condemned and you will face an eternity of judgment. You keep saying all this, but time keeps passing by and nothing happens. They deliberately overlook this, verse 5. By the word of God, 
The heavens came into being long ago and the earth was brought about from water and through water. Through these, that is God's word and the element of water, through these the world of that time perished when it was flooded. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are stored up for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly, those who reject Jesus. Verse eight, dear friends, don't overlook this one fact. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. So 12 months for King Nebuchadnezzar is nothing to God. Seven periods of time for King Nebuchadnezzar, nothing to God. 2,000 years, nothing to God. Do we have another year? Do we have another two years? Do we have another 50 years, another 100 years, another 1,000 years before the return of Christ? We don't know. It's nothing. Time is not influential in God's plan and purpose. Look at verse 9, though. The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you. Why? Here's his true heart, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. It will come. On that day, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. The elements will burn and be dissolved. And the earth and the works on it will be disclosed, revealed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, it's clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness. As you wait for the day of God and hasten its coming. Because of that day, the heavens will be dissolved with fire and the elements will melt with heat. But based on his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth, his promise, where righteousness dwells. Therefore, dear friends, while you wait for these things, make every effort to be found without spot or blemish in his sight. At peace. At peace. Also, regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. How are we to be at peace while we hasten his coming? We got to clear up the junk that's in here. We have to live in the peace of Christ. One can also choose to live with a broken and humbled heart before God. Look at Psalm 51 real quick. This will be our last verse. Psalm 51, verse number 17. Remember this psalm. David is crying out in his brokenness because of the sin he committed with Bathsheba. Not only that, he tried to cover it up, he tried to conceal it, he tried to hide the sin in his heart, he tried to control the environment, he put Uriah at the front of the lines, remember this? He's killed, he tries to fix things on his own, the prophet Nathan comes to him and says, not gonna work, you need to repent, and he does. He cries out to God from a place of brokenness, and he begins to declare that you, God, are the one who purify, you God are the one who cleanse, you God are the one who creates in me a clean heart, you God are the one who is just in your judgment, seven periods of time, just judgment. In eternity, just judgment. And he says in verse 17, the sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart, God, declaring to him, hey, you know what I need to do, God. And what David is saying in the brokenness and the, and the humility of his heart is brokenness. The, the root of that word means to abandon all, to be done with self. And humbled here, this intentional posture, presenting himself rightfully under the authority of God, saying you are just in your judgment, whatever that looks like. You are just in your punishment, whatever that looks like. You want to give me seven periods of time? It is a just sentence. 
but he also looks at God, don't miss this, and he says, you also, you're the one who can create in me a clean heart. You're the one who can purify me with hyssop. You're the one who can wash away my sins, making me whiter than snow. You're the one who can atone for my sins. And he rightly humbles himself, abandoning himself in his sin, saying, I am done with myself, and I intentionally, I place myself under the authority of God, and I say, you, God, are just in your judgment, and you're also merciful and compassionate and full of grace in your forgiveness. And he submits to that. That's all God wanted from King Nebuchadnezzar. That's all God wanted from the Ninevites. That's all God wants from this world, not wanting any to perish, but all to come in repentance. That's all God wants from his children right now. Call out to him, cry out to him. Is there something in your heart that needs to be cleared up? Is there something between you and another brother or sister in Christ that needs to be cleared up? Is there something in your heart that just needs to be poured out to him, finally acknowledging that he is the God who is just in his judgment, but he's also the God with power and love and mercy, and he pours that out on us through his son, Jesus, and by his blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He is faithful and just, forgiving us of our sins if we confess our sins instead of hiding them, instead of keeping them a secret. Do you know what we get? His mercy. Is there something in your heart that needs to be cleared up. Folks, that's what I wanna take from this story in Daniel chapter four. Recognizing my rightful position before God as a sinner, saved by grace, through faith, in my savior Jesus. I don't deserve to be standing here. I deserved the just judgment of God. But he has turned that from me and for some reason, because of his love and compassion, he has given me favor before him so that when he looks at me, he doesn't see me, he sees the righteousness of Christ around me, not deserving that. So who am I? Who am I to keep this junk inside of my heart and not go to those who I have offended, not go to those who I have ticked off, not go to those who have something against me and say, I'm so sorry. I want you to walk in freedom and I want you to walk in that, not, not a psycho babble gospel, folks, hear me. I want you to walk in that because that is truly where Christ wants us to be so that we can be victorious in him, praising and worshiping and focusing on him and what he has done and not on our junk. Amen? God, thank you for your word. Again, God, we just thank you for these examples through the prophet Daniel, through the prophet Jonah. God, we thank you for even the example that we have with King Nebuchadnezzar. And we can see what prevents most of us, what prevents everybody in this world from accepting your offer of mercy and grace is pride and arrogance. So God, would you help us to really understand what David began to understand after he sinned against you and you alone? Would you help us to put on that same spirit of brokenness to understand that you do not despise, you do not reject, you do not turn against a broken and humbled heart. So help us to put that on this morning. Help us to understand brokenness, to abandon everything, and to submit humbly, intentionally, to your authority in our lives. Father, help us to do that. 
recognizing we have an opportunity for repentance today, to make things right, to turn from our sinfulness. Father, we thank you so much for your relenting and your compassion and your mercy and your grace and your love that every day when we screw up and we trip and we fall and we, we sin against you and against others, you continue to pour out your grace so that we can get back up and we can learn to love and live and follow you more closely. So Father, I just thank you for this message. I thank you for this word and I thank you for everybody here. Father, take our hearts and our lives now. We love you in Jesus' name, amen.